Good Tuesday afternoon. Welcome back to Tuesday Night Bible Study. Tonight, we're going to pick back up. Of course, the title of our lesson is the uh, pre-tribulation. This, of course, will be uh, premillennial part 17, premillennial view part 17. So tonight, we're going to pick back up, if everyone would ch- turn to Revelation chapter 14. We're going to start back at verse 12, but we're going to do a little bit of a review for the first part of the chapter, and then we'll hopefully we'll finish the second part of the chapter tonight, and maybe even get into chapter 15 some tonight. But the first part of the chapter, we talked about um, how Jesus was standing on Mount Zion and with him 144,000 having his having his father's name written in their foreheads we talked about these and how these would have to be children these are a different group than the 144,000 Jews out of the 12 tribes of Israel that actually I think it's in Chapter 11, somewhere back in there, talks about the 144,000. This is a different group, and there's many defining characters in here as to why. We talked about it. These were first fruits of uh, Jesus Christ. In other words, they were the first martyrs. Uh, We talked about how they were innocent, uh, how they were not defiled with women. They were all virgins. We talked about how they were... uh, uh, how there was no guile in their mouth, how they was they were just completely innocent. And only a child could be innocent. What could we tie this back to? We tied this back to the massacre of the innocents in Matthew chapter 2, 16 through 18. We talked about how Jesus, when King Herod went out to find Jesus, he couldn't find him, so he killed all the male children in Israel at that time, two years and under. This would be the massacre of the innocents. These are these children from the from Bible from the best studies of Bible scholars is determined these are a different group, like I said. Now we get on down into the chapter here starting at verse six. We seen there's three different angels here preaching. And remember, I talked about this. There's a great spiritual battle going on right now at this point in time in Revelation here in this period of time because you had three angels here preaching the kingdom. And remember, we talked about why they're preaching the kingdom. They're not preaching salvation. The church is gone. They're preaching the millennial kingdom that Jesus will be coming back to set up. And... In this chapter, we've seen the first set of angels. The first angel here was was warning men not to believe in the Antichrist or to take his mark. And we moved on down to verse 8, where we've seen the second angel. He was preaching the fall of Babylon. Babylon is, uh, remember, we said is a city in a rock. And Babylon was a city that is going to prosper again. It is going to grow and prosper. And it's going to be a sinful, sinful city. And this angel was preaching that fall, this great city, and and what was going to happen because it made many people rebel against God. And that's what sin does, folks, is a rebel against God. Then we've seen here in verse 9, the third angel was preaching the doom of the of the antichrist worshipers or the beast worshipers he told us here if you receive the mark of the beast you're doomed you're you're done you are bought and paid for by the antichrist so up to that point we're getting ready to move into verse 12 let's pick up at verse 12 and we'll get through this chapter and like i said maybe even get started into chapter 15. all right Verse 12, here is the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. What saints 
is John the Revelator talking about here? He's talking about the future saints. Remember, the church is gone. They will be people saved during this time. Remember, we've talked about it, but you will have to lose. They will behead you because if you don't take the mark of the beast, you can't buy, sell, you can't buy groceries, you can't buy gas. You can't do anything without this mark. So you will have to turn yourself in or starve to death. One way or another, you will die for the Lord. And this is what it's talking. It's not talking about the saints today, the church today. The church is gone. Remember, the church is not mentioned again after chapter 4 of Revelation. The church is gone. Now, what it's talking about here is the patience of the saints. These are the people that's going to be martyred for Jesus during this time. Remember, you've got angels preaching the, the, the upcoming kingdom, the millennial kingdom or the millennial reign of Christ, and you have the Antichrist and the false prophet uh, claiming that the Antichrist is claiming to be God, and the false prophet is actually trying to push people to receive this mark. So you have a great spiritual warfare going on here, and you can see that in this chapter. That's one thing that I really love about this chapter. You can actually see the spiritual battle here going on between good and evil. And he says right here, here is the patience of the saints. In other words, the people that will be martyred during this period of time, which will be the last three and a half years of the tribulation. And he says right here, Saints, here are they that kept the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. In other words, they did not receive the mark. They were either beheaded or that they could have starved it as somehow they will have to die for the Lord. And let's go on. Verse 13, it says here, And I heard a voice from heaven saying unto me, Write. In other words, this is John talking now. The voice is telling him here, this voice from heaven is saying, write, in other words, write this down. Blessed are the dead which die in the Lord from henceforth. Yea, saith the Spirit, that they may rest from their labors and their works do follow them. So it's telling us here that these men and women, when they die for the Lord, they will be blessed. They will be, and we will see them again coming over here in, I think, in chapter 15. We're going to see what they call the Sea of Glass. We'll talk about that. But here are the martyred people that's going to be martyred for the Lord. So you can see how a Bible scholar can tie the first part of this chapter to the, because this, most of this chapter is talking about being martyred for Jesus. So the first 144,000 are the first fruits in verses 1 through 5. These are the first fruits. These were the first people, which were children to and under, that were martyred for the Lord. We get on down here to the end, mid trib to the end of trib. Uh, we see there going to be more people martyred for the Lord. Okay, so this this whole chapter is about spiritual warfare, warfare and martyrdom. So he says right here, and I heard a voice from heaven saying unto me, "Write, blessed are the dead which die in the Lord, from henceforth. Yea, saith the Spirit, that they may rest from their labors." and their works do follow them. What works are they talking about? First of all, the first work here would be obedience to God, uh, not accepting this mark. I'm sure they have, they have witnessed to several people also during this period of time, and, and they, of course, have also been martyred for the Lord. So it shows again how what we do for the Lord, we will be blessed for doing. Now, we're going to look here now at verses 14 through 20. This, of course, is talking about Armageddon. Armageddon is going to be, remember, there was a Gog Magog war we talked about, then there's a battle of Armageddon. How do we know that this is a battle of Armageddon? Because Jesus Christ will lead this battle. 
then there will be a future after the thousand year millennial reign there will be another Gog Magog war and of course we will break that down and talk about it as we get into it we see here what which is called the harvest and I'll explain this and there's a lot of, of if you guys want to write some of this down I'll give you guys some references to go by here the harvest which is Armageddon Go to Joel chapter 3, Matthew chapter 13, Matthew 38. Uh, you can go uh, 38 through 43 in chapter 13. Uh, most of this study chapter 13 of Matthew. Uh, Isaiah chapter 11, Jeremiah chapter 51, Ezekiel 38 and 39, Zechariah 14. And of course, we'll see Revelation 19 coming up where we talk about the battle of Armageddon. Of course, Jude 14. You can look at any of these references and it will refer you to what what Jesus, or excuse me, what John the Revelator is discussing here or talking about. So again, let's look at the harvest and we'll ex I'll explain that as we go. And I looked and behold a white cloud and on the cloud one set like unto the Son of Man having on his head a golden crown and in his hand a sharp crown sickle. Now you got to remember, we talked about this before. Uh, John the Revelator wrote this 1800, 1900 years ago. So what he's seeing in the future, and we don't know how much farther in the future this is going to be. I, I really believe it's not far off, but again, that's, the Bible doesn't, it's not specific on when, when Jesus will come back and when all of this will take place. But Remember, the book of Revelation is nothing but word pictures, and this is how he describes the harvest. In other words, when you harvest something, it is ripe. It's ready for you to bring it in. Okay. In other words, during this time, sin has ripened these people to where harvest has to happen now. Does that make sense? So we see here, he says, And I looked, and behold, a white cloud, and upon the cloud one set unto like the Son of Man. This is Jesus. And it says, having a, ha, how do we know this is Jesus? Because he has on his head a golden crown. Jesus Christ is the King of kings and Lord of lords. We know that this is Jesus. And in his hand a sharp sickle. This is a word picture. In other words, when you harvest something, what do you do? You with a sickle, you cut it down. Okay, just like wheat, whatever it is, you take this sickle, you cut it down, and you gather it together, right? To bring back to the storehouse. All right, let's get into this. So Jesus himself is getting ready to leave heaven and to destroy these armies that's formed against him in the land of Israel. Jesus, the Old Testament saints, the New Testament saints, which is the church, and all his angels will be following him back. And we will see that when we get into verse, excuse me, chapter 19. But he, John the Revelator has given us a little bit of a, um, a, could we say a little bit of a, uh, a little bit of a lesson that's going to come later here. And he says, and John says, and another angel came out of the temple crying with a loud voice to him that sat on the cloud, thrust in thy sickle and reap, for the time is come for thee to reap, for the harvest or the earth is ripe. Let's break this verse down. This angel is crying to the Lord. He's saying, Thrust in your sickle. In other words, destroy these men and these armies. Because the time of sin has come for you to destroy and you annihilate these armies that go against you and go against God. So he's telling here this, in other words, the harvest of earth is ripe. It's ready to be annihilated. All right. 
Verse 16. And he that sat on the cloud thrust in his sickle on the earth, and the earth was reaped. In other words, Jesus will completely and utterly destroy this, uh, these armies when they step into or onto the land of Israel when he comes back during the battle of Armageddon. So we see here another angel. So this is already, we've talked about one angel, two angels. This one right here is the third. In other words, another angel came out of the temple, which is in heaven. He also having a sharp sickle. Verse 18, and another angel, this would be the fourth angel right here, just in the harvest of Armageddon, come out of the altar, which had power over fire. And he cried with a loud cry to him that had the sharp sickle, saying, Thrust in thy sharp sickle, gather the clusters of the vine of the earth, for her grapes are fully ripe. In other words, sin, it, it, in other words, Jesus is not going to put up with no more sin. It's done. He is going to complete right here. He's going to utterly destroy. This is when he will set up his uh, millennial reign for a thousand years. Like I said, this John Reveler has just given us a little bit of history, of future history that's going to happen during this time. So when you when you destroy when 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 you gather grapes, let's use grapes for a, a good example. What happens to that grape to make wine? You have to utterly crush it. And the juice from it is what makes the wine. You have to destroy it, right? All right. Let's look at this. He says, thrust in thy sharp sickle, gather the clusters of the vine of the earth, for her grapes are fully ripe. All right. Verse 19. And the angel thrust in his sickle into the earth and gathered the vine of the earth and cast it into the great winepress of the wrath of God. Remember, this is a word picture. In other words, Jesus is going to utterly destroy, mash. I mean, it. we're going to see how much blood is going to be here in a minute when he's talking about during this battle. This is how graphic it's going to be. When you, just, when you put grapes in a wine press, what happens? You press that grape, it mashes it, utterly obliterates it, and what juice comes from it makes the wine. So that's what's going to happen to these people or these armies that's here on this earth during this period. Verse 20, And the winepress was trodden without the city. And listen to this now. And blood came out of the winepress, even unto the horses' bridles, for the space of a thousand and six hundred furlongs. That's a hundred and eighty-four miles. Folks, imagine the size of this army. That it's going, blood is going to be as tall as the horse's bridles for 184 miles. This is just a glimpse of John the Revelator giving us of what's to come. And since we went ahead and talked about it, I'm going to go ahead and move on into verse uh, chapter 15. And we're going to see, we're going to remember we, this, this whole chapter again was about martyrdom. And we're going to see right here, again, let's look and go ahead and go to chapter 15. We, we, we've actually completed 14. And I saw, remember, I is John, he's the, he's the author. God, of course, God's the author, but John is the writer. He's, he writes it down. And I saw another sign in heaven, great and marvelous, he says. Seven angels having the seven last plagues, for in them is filled up with the wrath of God. In other words, folks, 
I've said this all along. We serve a God of love. He, he loves us unconditionally. He wants us all to change. He wants us all to be saved through his son, through salvation, and serve him. But there's going to come a time when God is wrath, and this is the time. God judges sin. And I've said this since the book we've, we've studied since, since, let's say, the book starting, which is Genesis, is the first chapter. So Revelation, I think it's chapter 22 is the last chapter. You will see man sin and rebel against God, and you will see God's judgment come. And again, I don't like to get out of context of what we're studying, but the world we live in today is full of sin. And the way things are going today, God, God is going to judge these nations, folks. And it's coming. I mean, it is. And we can see it from Genesis to Revelation. Man sins, man rebels against God, God's judgment falls. Man straightens up a minute, he sins all the way through the end of the book. All right, so we see here God's wrath is getting ready to fall again. Now, this verse 2, we're going to talk about a sea of glass. Now, when you think of the word sea, of course it means peoples here. But when you think of the word sea, how big is a sea? It's vast, right? It's humongous. You couldn't, you can't see from one end to the other of it. You don't have no idea how how many miles it is from one end to the other. Well, that's how big this is going to be, because this is how John the Revelator labels it. And I saw, as it were, a sea of glass mingled with fire. And them that had gotten the victory over the beast. Remember, them that had gotten, this is past tense now of the martyrs that verse or Revelation 14 was talking about here of the martyred people. During the tribulation, he's given us a glimpse here. He's saying, and them that had gotten the victory over the beast and over his image and over his mark and over the number of his name stand on the sea of glass having harps of God. In other words, there's so many here, is it, uh, a sea couldn't measure them, okay? It tells us here, they're having harps in their hands. They're happy now. They're content. They're getting ready to sing a song. Verse 3, it says, And they sing the song of Moses, the servant of God, and the song of the Lamb, saying, Great and marvelous are thy works, Lord God Almighty, just and true are thy ways, thou King of saints. Now, let's break this verse down before we go any farther here. Verse 3, why would they sing a song of Moses and a song of the Lamb? You see two different grouped peoples here. You will see Gentiles as well as Jews. What songs would the Jews sing here? They would sing the songs of Moses because they they didn't believe that Jews didn't believe in Christ at this point in time. Remember? Salvations of the of the Gentiles. Several Jews were several Jews do, folks, but what I'm saying is at this point right here, it's showing us two different groups. It's showing us the Jewish people as well as the Gentiles. They sang the Song of Moses, which is uh, the Jewish people, and the Song of the Lamb. That means these are Gentile people also, saying, Great and marvelous are thy works, Lord God Almighty. Just and true are thy ways, the King of saints. And he says, Who shall not fear thee, O Lord, and glorify thy name? For thou only art holy, for all nations shall come and worship before thee, and thy judgments are made manifest. All right. He's giving us another future glimpse here of what's to come. 
during the millennial reign. He says right here, You who shall not fear thee, O Lord, and glorify thy name, for thou only art holy, for all nations shall come and worship before thee. All nations. Every nation. Thy judgments are made manifest. So we see here what's to come and the judgments that are going to fall. And we will pick back up next week. We will start back with verse 5. Uh, and we will pick up on, we're getting ready to see these uh, seven plagues or seven vials. Everyone have a blessed and wonderful Tuesday evening. Thank you for joining in. And please invite someone to join in next uh, Tuesday. We will continue our learning from the book of Revelation. Again, everyone have a blessed and wonderful evening. Good night.